Let's now take a look at the challenging issue of evaluation in the context of machine translation. In this presentation, we will be utilizing slides made by Philip Kern, the author of the Statistical Machine Translation and Neural Machine Translation textbooks. The question of evaluation has been around since the very beginning of machine translation. In the ALPAC report, a significant portion is dedicated to the issue of evaluation. In that case, using humans to evaluate the quality of machine translation. In this presentation, we will look at various modes of evaluation, both automatic and manual. When we talk about evaluation, we are asking the question, how good is a given machine translation system? Or, alternatively, how good is a particular sentence that was translated using machine translation? This is a very challenging problem. It's very non-trivial. It's hard because many different translations are often acceptable. Given two translations, they may have semantic equivalents, and they may be very similar in meaning. So when we're looking at evaluation metrics, we have a few options. We could look at subjective judgments by human evaluators. So this is typically what we mean when we talk about manual evaluation. There are also the possibility of automatic evaluation metrics. So metrics that can take a translation and its reference and provide an answer, a number, that says how good is this sentence, or how good, in general, is the output of a system. Those are the two primary metrics that are used, types of metrics, manual evaluation metrics and automation, automatic evaluation metrics. But there are others that could be considered, such as task-based evaluation. Task-based evaluation could come in the form of post-editing. So you could ask how much post-editing is required in order to edit a machine translation output into an acceptable output that a human would say is completely correct. Another type of task-based evaluation would ask the question, does information come across? So can a target language monolingual speaker read the output of machine translation and get enough information to do a particular task? So let's look a little bit more at this. So in this use case, we take advantage of the fact that machine translation is almost always a means to an end. And we ask the question, for a particular context, for a particular task, does machine translation help a user accomplish the task? So we talked about the post-editing task. Let's talk about another task, information gathering. So in this use case, a target language user wants to access a foreign language news site. So you could set up a task that success would be measured by the ability of a target language reader to successfully answer certain questions about the content of the foreign language news source. And if the reader who only knows the target language is able to successfully answer content questions, so comprehension questions about the content of the foreign news article, then you would judge that the machine translation succeeded. So let's take a look at this. So a content understanding test would say, given machine translation output, can a monolingual target language speaker answer questions about it? So this could come in the form of questions about basic facts, the who, what, when, why, where, numbers, names, dates that are encoded in the original article. Other questions that you could ask would be about actors or events that are described in the original article. So 
What are the relationships between this person and that person, each of whom was mentioned in the article? What is the sequence of temporal events that are described in the article? Can the reader put those con put identify the events, identify the actors, specify who did what, when, and where, what, and specify what the correct order of those events was? Causal order could also be asked. So you could ask, did event X cause event Y, if X and Y are both described in the original text? Then you could get to more subtle questions of nuance and author intent. And these are potentially deeper and more challenging questions. So you could ask, what did the author of the original article emphasize? Now, that may or may not come across in machine translation. You could ask questions about subtext. So issues that the author of the original text didn't explicitly state, but a good translation would still bring out. So why isn't this type of test more prevalent? Well, to begin with, it's very, very difficult to devise effective content understanding questions. And doing so is very specific to a particular text. So if you come up with questions for one text and then you want to translate and test another set, you're going to have to come up with specific questions for each document. So in the workshop on machine translation in 2009 and 2010, there was an attempt to use this methodology. So there was a sentence editing test. So person A would edit the translation, the results of machine translation. So person A would post edit the machine translation just to try to make it fluent. And person A would not be provided with access to the source text and would not be provided access to the reference text. So the hypothesis here is if person A can make the text fluent, so post edit the machine translation output to make it fluent, and if the machine translation was good, then the content should also come through. So then person B would then look at the edit and judge it according to either the source or the reference and ask the question, did person A understand the content correctly? So did the translation correctly convey the content? Let's take a look at the issue of multiple meanings. So for any given sentence in a particular language, there will almost always be many different valid ways to translate that sentence into a given target language. So here at the top, we have an example of a sentence written in Chinese. Below it, we have a number of different English translations. So let's take a minute and talk through these. And if you're bilingual in Chinese, then you can use that knowledge to try to figure out which of these is valid, is there a gradient, which one is the best, which one is the worst. So let's go. So the first one is, Israeli officials are responsible for airport security. Okay, next we've got, Israel is in charge of the security at this airport. So the emphasis is maybe a little different, but those two sentences to me seem like they convey more or less the same meaning. Let's go to the third one. The security work for this airport is the responsibility of the Israel government. So that one, the fluency isn't as great, uh, mostly because of the phrase Israel government. So I would expect either government of Israel or Israeli government. So next, translation four. Israeli side was in charge of the security of this airport. So here we've got a little difference in meaning. Again, the fluency isn't great. I would want to see the Israeli side, perhaps, uh, or the Israeli government. But we're definitely missing a determiner. 
uh, was in charge. There's a tense difference here. So this sentence is in past tense. So Israeli side was as opposed to Israeli side is in charge. So the first three translations made it seem like uh, the responsibility is current. It's in the present tense. And this sentence makes it seem like it's in the past tense. So translation number five. Israel is responsible for the airport's security. That seems fine to me. I don't read Chinese, so I can't compare it with the original. But the meaning of translation five seems very similar to translations one and two and three. Translation six. Israel is responsible for safety work at this airport. So fluency seems great. Fluency of that sentence seems fine, but the meaning seems a little suspect. Now, if this had been the only translation of this Chinese sentence, because I don't speak or read Chinese, I wouldn't have any reason to doubt that this is a completely valid translation. But given that all of the other sentences use the term security, I'm suspect and I'm wondering if safety here isn't the best choice and instead if it should have been security. Safety and security are related concepts, but airport security is a more well-known entity than airport safety. Those are different things. All right, let's move on to the next one. Israel presides over the security of the airport. Fluency seems mostly fine. Adequacy, presiding over the security of, I don't know. Something about that seems a little off. Uh, fluency and adequacy both seem fine, but there's something I can't quite put my finger on. Maybe it's just the, the word choice. Presiding over the security of an airport seems like an odd word choice. Um, normally you would run the airport security, but presiding seems a little weird. But that's kind of a subtle distinction. All right, next one. Israel took charge of the airport security. Okay, this one seems okay. The emphasis is different. So this, this is implying that there's a change of state. So Israel perhaps wasn't in charge of the airport security, but now is. Okay, next. The safety of this airport is taken charge of by Israel. So that seems fairly similar to the previous one, but maybe in a pass more passive and less active. Uh, is taken charge of is also a little bit weird in terms of the wording. All right, next. This airport security is the responsibility of the Israeli security officials. Okay, that one seems fine. There's a little bit different focus on the security officials here as opposed to the government or officials. So, it turns out that these were that this was a, a real sentence in an evaluation set uh, run by NIST in 2001. And the sentence was in Chinese. And all of these were human translations. So all of these were produced by human translators. So this, is, this shows a wide variance, even among human translators. And we can see that the adequacy and fluency of human translations varies from translator to translator. So it also shows that different people may well differ about which of these is the best and which of these is sufficiently adequate. So we've talked before about adequacy and fluency. Let's look at them in detail. So adequacy and fluency are metrics. They're evaluation metrics and they're evaluation metrics produced by humans. So they're manual evaluation metrics. These metrics involve human judgment and that human judgment is subjective. We can try our best to define it, but ultimately it's very hard to get an objective measure of adequacy and fluency. So 
In this task, the human evaluator is given a machine translation output. They are also given either the original source text, if the human judge can read the source language, or they're given the reference text. The human judge is assumed to be fluent in the target language. So you'll be given the source and or the, the reference, possibly both. Um, and then based on either the reference or the source or both, the human judge is to assess the quality of the machine translation compared to the reference or compared to the source. So let's look at the metrics. The metric of adequacy attempts to capture the question, does the translation convey the same meaning as the original? Is part of the message lost? Is additional, are additional things added that weren't in the original? Is anything distorted? So a fully adequate translation would convey all of the meaning of the original with nothing added and nothing distorted. Fluency is a separate metric. So the evaluation metric of fluency asks the question, is the translation fluent in the target language? So answering this question involves both issues of grammatical correctness. So is the translation grammatical? Does it comport with the grammar of the target language? But it also involves idiomatic word choices. So when I was judging just a few minutes ago these uh, English translations of the Chinese sentence, you noticed that there were a couple of points where I said things like, that doesn't sound quite right. That falls into the domain of idiomatic word choices. So it's, it's entirely possible for a translation to be fully grammatical in the target language, but still make sufficiently non-idiomatic word choices that the fluency feels off to the reader. Typically, adequacy and fluency are judged on five-point scales. So here are examples uh, from the workshop on machine translation when that workshop has used adequacy and fluency uh, by human judges. So let's look at adequacy. So in adequacy, we have this five-point scale. So a judge could rate a, sent a translation as one, two, three, four, or five in terms of adequacy. Five means absolutely no meaning came across. Two means some meaning, a little bit came across. Three means much of the meaning came across. Four means most of the meaning came across. And five means all of the meaning of the original sentence came across. Fluency is similar. So the fluency scale goes from one to five. One, two, three, four, five. So the human judge can rank a particular sentence as being one, two, three, four, or five on the fluency scale. In this scale, one means completely incomprehensible. So it's just not, if English is the target language, it's just not readable English. You can't make anything out. Two would be disfluent English. So you can tell it's English, but it's, it's quite disfluent. Doesn't sound at all like, a, like English should. Three would be non-native English. So non-native English might read like uh, poorly translated text. So you could tell the meaning, you can tell that it's English, it's parts of it are fluent, but perhaps it has non-idiomatic word choices or odd word order. Four, in terms of fluency, is good. It's not perfect, but it's good. The fluency is good. And five is flawless. So the fluency in the target language is flawless. So the workshop for machine translation uh, has annual evaluation competitions 
where various labs can submit their machine translation of a particular evaluation set for a particular language. And then uh, there are human judgments made for all of these systems. So this is an example of a user interface that was presented for one year, the WMT-06 French English evaluation. So this would have been from 2006. You can see here that the annotator was Philip Kuhn, the textbook author. And we, we see the French source sentence, the English reference sentence, and then five translations. And for each translation, the annotator, the judge, is asked to rank the adequacy and fluency of each sentence, of each translation. And you see here in the lower right that we have the same scales for adequacy and fluency, the five-point scales that we just talked about. So let's go through this sentence. The reference is rather the two countries form a laboratory needed for the internal working of the EU. Okay, I don't read French, so I can't judge how good that is, the reference is. So this is actually an issue. If you're providing a reference and asking the judge to make judgments of adequacy and fluency based on a reference, that is predicated on the assumption that you have a high quality reference, that the reference itself is adequate and fluent. And there have been times in this WMT history that that has not always been the case. Um, so that's why in the ideal case, you would have a bilingual judge. So a judge who can look at the source sentence and use their knowledge of both languages to judge the adequacy of the translations. So translation one, both countries are rather a necessary laboratory, the internal operation of the EU. So the judge, which here was Philip, judged the adequacy of this to be five. So meaning all of the meaning came across, and the fluency was five, meaning flawless English. I think I disagree with Philip's judgment on this one a little bit. I don't think I would have judged that four. I think he's right on the adequacy. I agree that all the content came across, uh, but I disagree on fluency. We've got both countries are rather a necessary laboratory, the internal operation of the EU. To me, I think there's a preposition needed between laboratory and the. So if it had been both countries are rather a necessary laboratory for the internal operation of the EU, as in the reference, that would have been perfect. But I think I would have, if I were the judge, have given this sentence a four on fluency rather than a five. So let's look at the next translation. Both countries are, are, excuse me, both countries are a necessary laboratory at internal functioning of the EU. So interestingly, Philip rated this as a three uh, for adequacy and a three for fluency. I think I probably would have rated four for adequacy and four for fluency for this one. All right, next. The two countries are rather a laboratory necessary for the internal workings of the EU. Okay, uh, that seems really good. Uh, the fluency of that actually to me seems better than the reference. Um, Philip marked that as a four and a four. The two countries are rather a laboratory -ness. I think I would have given that a five for adequacy and fluency. All right, next, uh, the two countries are rather a laboratory for the internal workings of the EU. A three for adequacy and a five for fluency. I think I would have given that a five and a five. And finally, the two countries are rather a necessary laboratory internal workings of the EU. Uh, fluency on that is not great. It's not awful, but it's not good. Or rather a necessary laboratory internal. Yeah, that one also needs a, 
a preposition, but I think the adequacy to me seems fine. I would probably give that a five for adequacy and a four for fluency. All right, so you can see this is not a trivial task. So now I'm gonna ask you to do this. So take, let's, let's go through these and I want you to get out a pencil and paper and for each of these outputs, system one, system two, and system three, write down on the scale of one to five, the adequacy and fluency for these systems. So here's the reference. NSA affair emphasizes complete lack of debate on intelligence. System one, the NSA case underscores the total lack of debate on intelligence. System two, the case highlights the NSA total absence of debate on intelligence. System three, the matter NSA underlines the total absence of debates on the piece of information. So I'd like you to now pause the video and come up with your adequacy and fluency judgments for system one, system two, and system three. And then when you come back, you can compare that to mine. Okay, so here's my judgments. I would say system one gets, for me, gets a five for adequacy and a five for fluency. I, all of the content comes across and I, that reads to me as perfect English. System two, the case highlights the NSA total absence of debate on intelligence. I feel like we're missing a word between NSA and total absence. Uh, highlights the NSA. Yeah, there's, there's something word order is missing. It's not perfectly fluent. Uh, adequacy though, I would, I think I would struggle on this and it would either be a four or a five. Um, to me, the lack of fluency in the middle of the sentence, the word ordering actually potentially impinges a little bit on the adequacy because I'm not quite sure from this sentence what the relationship is between the NSA and the total absence of debate on intelligence. Uh, fluency, I think I'd give it a four. So probably a four and a four. System three, the matter NSA underlines the total absence of debates on the piece of information. Matter NSA underlines. Okay, so this is much less fluent. There's parts of it that are fluent, but overall it's not because the matter NSA underlines doesn't make sense. So I think I'm gonna give this one a three on adequacy and a three on fluency. So how does that compare to yours? So five and five, four and four, three and three. Okay, let's try one more. Reference, is there not an element of hypocrisy on your part? System one, would it not as a wave of hypocrisy on your part? System two, is there would be no hypocrisy like a wave of your hand? And system three, is there not as a wave of hypocrisy from you? Okay, pause the video and I want you to rank, to, to give your five point rankings for system one, system two, and system three. Okay, let's go through mine. System one, would it not as a wave of hypocrisy on your part? So I come across, I, I get that there's something to do with hypocrisy on your part, but it's not clear what. So 
the first the meaning from the first half of the sentence is lost. So I'm going to give that a three on adequacy and a five on fluency. It reads like a totally legit English sentence. It sounds a little archaic, just the wording, would it not, as a wave. So it sounds a little bit Shakespeare-like, but it reads to me like a completely fluent English sentence. Would it not, as a wave of hypocrisy on your part. Uh, maybe a four, but I, I'm going to go with a five. All right, system two. Is there would be no hypocrisy like a wave of your hand? Ah, uh, that's pretty bad. I need to double check the scales for this one. So let's look. Two means little meaning, three means much meaning. Okay, I'm going to give that a two for adequacy. There's a little bit of meaning, but not much. And I'm going to give that a three for fluency. Is there would be no hypocrisy like a wave of your hand? The like a wave of your hand is fine. That's fluent, but the sentence as a whole, no. All right, system three. Is there not as a wave of hypocrisy from you? Okay, so this one, there's a little bit more meaning. I'm getting there's hypocrisy and it's related to you. So I'm going to give this one a three for adequacy. Is there not as a wave of hypocrisy from you? The fluency is actually pretty good. The meaning is mostly gibberish, but I'm going to give that a four for fluency. All right, so how does that compare to you? All right. Let's, uh, got my video cutting off the bottom one, so I'll have to read the bottom one for you. Uh, all right, so this will be our last one. Has France benefited from the intelligence supplied by the NSA concerning terrorist operations against our interests? Okay, that's the reference. System one, France has benefited from information supplied by the NSA on terrorist operations against our interests. System two, has the France received information from the NSA regarding terrorist operations aimed at our interests? And actually, let's just skip this, skip system three. So system, take a minute, judge system one and system two. Okay, so the reference again was, has France benefited from the intelligence supplied by the NSA concerning terrorist operations against our interest? System one. France has, so it's a question, but there's no question word at the beginning. France has benefited from information supplied by the NSA on terrorist operations against our interests. So it's a question. <sighs> I don't like it, but the adequacy actually seems fine. So I'm going to give that a five for adequacy and a four for fluency. Uh, the only thing that's weird about it is the fact that you, it's not worded as a question, but it still has a question mark. So I'm going to give it a four. All right, system two. Has the France received information from the NSA regarding terrorist operations aimed at our aimed our interests. See, I almost filled in a blank that's not there. Has the France received information from the NSA regarding terrorist operations aimed our interests? Has France benefited from the intelligence? So this is saying, has France received the information? The reference is saying, has France benefited from the, inf from the information? So it's definitely not all of the information. I'm going to give that a four for adequacy. Has the France, and a four for fluency. The France does not, that's disfluent English. It's fine in French, they have like there's literally la France, but I'm going to give that a four. So what does this show us? So my guess is that my judgments did not perfectly match yours. And in fact, that's what 
the organizers of the WMT 2006 evaluation found that when they uh, mapped the made a histogram of the adequacy judgments made by different evaluators for the same data set, this is what they found. So these were five different evaluators. You can see there's quite a difference. So the number of ones doesn't vary a lot except for the second evaluator. The second evaluator gave a lot of ones and a huge number of twos. Um, on the other hand, evaluators three, four, and five were all, all gave more fours and fives than evaluator two. And evaluator one gave plenty of threes and fours, but not nearly as many fives. So there's a lot of inconsistency. So how do you quantify that? How do you measure agreement between evaluators? Well, a very common way of doing this is to calculate something that's called the kappa coefficient. So the kappa coefficient is defined by the formula that you see here. So in this formula, we define P, sub, P in parentheses A as the proportion of times that the evaluators agree. So if you've got two evaluators and they agree two times out of five, so there were five sentences that they evaluated, excuse me, uh, yeah, so you get a fraction here. So P, uh, P of A is the proportion of times that the evaluators agree, P of E is the proportion of times they would agree by chance. So given a five point scale, they should agree by chance one out of five times. All right, so kappa then, the kappa coefficient is calculated by taking the proportion of times that the evaluators agree minus the proportion of times they would agree by chance and then divide that by one minus the proportion of times that they would agree by chance. It turns out that the kappa coefficient for adequacy and fluency is not great. So when adequacy and fluency kappa coefficients were calculated for the WMT 2007 evaluation campaign, uh, it was found that the proportion of agreement for fluency was 0.4, for adequacy was 0.38, and the agreement by chance was 0.2, which means that we had a kappa for fluency of 0.25 and a kappa for adequacy of 0.226. So those are not great. Um, they're, they're just not great. It's, we would like there to be much better agreement among annotators. So, in subsequent years at WMT, a question was asked by the organizers, could we come up with a better evaluation metric where the evaluators are able to be more consistent? And one way of doing that is to rank the translations. So rather than use a five point scale, ask, is this translation better than a different one, worse than the different one, or are they the same? So given two translations, rank them as either a is better than B, B is better than A, or they're the same. And it turns out that people are more consistent at being able to do this. So this intuitively makes some sense. This, is, this feels to me like an easier judgment. So judging two translations at a time, better, worse, equal. And the kappa coefficient here is 0.37. So this is better. In subsequent years, since these slides were made, uh, there's been additional experimentation using a global ranking system. So for each sentence, you rank it on its own as between zero and 100 for how good it is. So that's another evaluation type. So let's take a step back and ask what are the goals that we're trying to get at when we're defining evaluation metrics. So let's look at what would an ideal metric, what properties would an ideal metric have? So one might be low cost. So 
you would like the ideal evaluation metric to not take a long time and not cost a lot of money. So, or in other words, if you're trying to come up with a better evaluation metric, you would ideally like your new metric to reduce time with respect to your prior evaluation metric and cost less than using your prior evaluation metric. So low cost. Another metric is tunability. So this is gonna be especially relevant for automated metrics that are calculated by a computer. So for automated metrics, we would like the metric to be tunable. That is, we would be able to optimize using whatever machine learning framework we're using to train our machine translation system. We would like to be able to automatically optimize that system's performance against the metric. So this would require us to be able to automatically evaluate multiple times and there, for the, and there to be consistency. The next goal is that it be meaningful. So ideally we would like a score reported by an evaluation metric to be intuitively interpretable. That is, the score should give an intuitive interpretation of the translation quality. So you get not back just a number that's meaningless, but a number that you can say, oh, number X means such and such. So if I get uh, a 7.85, that means it's a bad translation. If I get a 37, that means that it's an okay translation. Consistency. So we would like our metric to be consistent. So repeated use of the metric should give the same results. So we can see that adequacy and fluency don't score great on consistency. So the kappa coefficient is measuring consistency to some extent and is telling us that those metrics aren't great for consistency. So automated metrics presumably are gonna be much better at consistency. And finally, we want the metric to be correct. So if we have two translations or two translation systems, we would like our metric to rank the better system as higher and the lower system as worse. Other criteria. So other criteria that can come into play are speed, size, integration, and customizability. So speed. We want faster machine translation systems. And if our evaluation criterion is being deployed during training time and it's super slow, that's going to speed down the development process. Size. We would like our uh, machine translation system to be able to fit into available memory. So this is less about the evaluation metric and more about the system itself. Speed is also about the system itself. Evaluation metrics aside, we would like the machine translation system itself to be fast and for its memory footprint to be low. Integration can be an issue. If you have an existing workflow that requires machine translation, we want the machine translation system to be able to be integrated into that workflow. And we want it to be customizable. So we want it to be the, the machine translation to adapt to the user's needs. So let's now take a moment and look at evaluation metrics that are automatic. So the motivation behind automated evaluation metrics is that we have a goal that we want a computer program to compute the quality of translations. This is advantageous mostly in the context of machine learning tuning our machine translation system. So in this context, an automated evaluation metric would be low cost, would be tunable, and would be consistent. So the basic strategy here is given a machine translation output and a human reference translation, the metric should complete compute 
a similarity score between them. So let's look at a couple of possible metrics. So we've got precision and recall. So precision and recall are very common in a lot of different computational areas. So here we've got a system output. So system A says Israeli officials responsibility of airport safety. So this is the sentence that we saw at the beginning with the Chinese sentence that was translated into English. So here we've got one reference and the reference is Israeli officials are responsible for airport security. So let's calculate precision and recall. So pre precision is gonna ask how many words in the translation were correct divided by the output length. So here the output, the translation, had one, two, three, four, five, six words. And of those, three Israeli officials and airport were correct. So that leaves us with three out of six. So the precision for this sentence, given this reference, is 50%. Okay, let's calculate recall. So recall is going to ask how many words in the translation are correct divided by how many words are in the reference. So the reference is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words long. And of those, three words in the system output match. So that leaves us with three divided by seven, which is approximately 43%. Now, in many disciplines, recall and precision are combined in a way that balances both of them in a measure called F measure. So F measure combines precision and recall, weighting them. So it's calculated by taking precision times recall and dividing that all by precision plus recall divided by two. So this would give us five times 4.3 in the numerator and, excuse me, 0.5 times 0.43 in the numerator and 0.5 plus 4.4 plus five plus, sorry, five plus 4.3, all divided by two in the denominator, giving us with an F measure of 46%. Unfortunately, F measure and recall aren't particularly well suited to the task, especially F measure. So let's look at a hypothetical system B where system B produces all of the right words, but there's simply a reordering issue. So what we did here is we took the reference and took the last two words of the reference and moved them to the beginning of the sentence. Everything else is perfect. So we've got the references, Israeli officials are responsible for airport security the hypothetical system B output is airport security, Israeli officials are responsible. So I would say the adequacy of that is actually still very good. The fluency isn't perfect, but it's not bad. And overall, I would say that system B is much better than the system A output, which was Israeli officials' responsibility of airport safety. So ideally, system B should get better scores than system A. Well, precision and recall and F measure all say that system A is way better than system B. Uh, excuse me, the system B is way better. So, but it goes beyond that and says they're perfect. So system A had 50% precision, system B has 100% precision. Okay, that's good, but it's not getting penalized for the reordering flaw. So it shouldn't be 100%. Recall here also is 100%, and F measure is also 100%. So according to these metrics, this system B output could not be better, and that's false. It could be better. It's better than system A, and the metrics show that, but it's not perfect. So over the decades, machine translation researchers have asked, 
are there other automated metrics that we can use that are better than precision and recall? One of the first metrics that was looked at was word error rate. So this, like many things in the history of machine translation, was first used in automatic, automatic speech recognition and then brought to machine translation by researchers who were doing both, who were familiar with the metric from speech recognition. So word error rate asks, what is the minimum number of editing steps to transform an output into to match a reference? So this requires calculating Levenstein distance. There are four possible four possibilities at each at each step. We could have a match, that is the two words match. So at every step we're going to be comparing two words, one word from the reference to one word in the translation. And they could match. If they match, there's no cost associated with them. For the other three possibilities, there's going to be a cost. So if there's a substitution where we replace one word with another, there could be an insertion where you add a word, or there could be a deletion where you drop a word. And word error rate is calculated by adding the number of substitutions, insertions, and deletions, those all count against you, divided by the reference length. And Levenstein distance can be calculated very nicely by dynamic programming. And what you see here are the dynamic programming charts for system A and for system B. And by taking the least cost path through this dynamic programming chart from the upper left corner to the lower right corner, we, we find uh, we can get the uh, set of choices that will be associated in our calculations for word error rate. So word error rate for system A ends up being 57%, and for system B ends up being 71%. So this is an improvement. This is, this is good. System B is recognized as being better than system A, but it's, it's not being marked as perfect, which it shouldn't be. So another way of thinking about calculating error rate is thinking of edit rate. So in addition to automated metrics, you could have a human in the loop. So let's first, before we add the human, make one tweak to word error rate. And that is when we look back at system B, there's really only one error and that's a movement. So a chunk was moved. So the, the, the two word phrase, airport security was moved to, from the end of the sentence in the reference to the beginning of the sentence in the system B output. So translation error rate or translation edit rate is very similar to word error rate, but it allows movements of chunks at a cost of one for the movement rather than moving each item which means that the translation error rate for system B would be lower than the word error rate for system B. Calculating translation error rate is a bit costly in terms of computation, but it is, it is usually feasible. Uh, but this could also be done by a human. So the way this would work is you would have a human post editor sit down with uh, a with a translation and manually edit the translation until it's acceptable. So the advantage of this is you don't have to perfectly match a separate reference translation. You could have a reference, you could have the source if you've got a bilingual doing this, but regardless of whether you got the reference or the source, the human could recognize a variant of the translation. So they can make edits to the translation recognize that the meaning of their edited translation is the same as the reference, even though there's differences between them. So this is quite time consuming, but it has that big advantage. And this was actually used as the official evaluation metric for a major 
uh, government-sponsored machine translation program, the DARPA Gale program, which ran from 2005 through 2011. This gets us to blue. Uh, so blue is the most widely used automated machine translation metric. It's not perfect, but it was really the first metric that gained widespread usage and widespread support. And although there have been many, many, many metrics proposed since then, many of which are technically superior to blue, none of them have dethroned to blue. So uh, if you speak French, you're probably cringing at my pronunciation. I pronounce it like most English speakers do. Uh, if you run into a French speaker, a Canadian or uh, a French machine translation researcher, uh, they will almost certainly pronounce it the correct French way. Uh, but most people who are not native French speakers pronounce it blue. So what does blue do? Blue calculates an n-gram overlap between machine translation output and a reference translation. So this is going to be a modified precision metric. So because blue wanted to take into account the possibility of multiple references, it left out recall. But because it left out recall, there's a way to game the system by just producing really short translations and to prevent systems from gaming it, gaming the metric by creating one or two word sentences that have very frequent words in them, a brevity penalty is added. Uh, so let's go through this. So we're gonna compute precision for n-grams ranging from size one up through size four. And then we're going to calculate the ratio of the translation output length in terms of words compared to the reference in terms of words. So the formulas you see here is going to calculate the minimum of either one or the output length over the reference length, and then multiply that by uh, this combination of precisions. So we're gonna take the precision scores from n-grams one, two, three, and four, and combine them in this way. Now, blue is really only meaningful when computed over a corpus. It's not well-defined at the level of the sentence. So that's one disadvantage of blue. And one advantage of a metric like TER. TER can be calculated at the level of the, of the sentence. Here, even though I just said that you can't do it, we're going to go ahead and calculate blue at the level of the sentence, but you'll see why in this example it's not done because you end up in a lot of cases with zeros. So here is our system A and system B. System A was our example, Israeli officials' responsibility of airport safety. System B was airport security, Israeli officials are responsible. So. System B has a two gram match and a four gram match and implicit in the four gram match are various one, two and three gram matches. So we see here that precision at the one gram for system A is three out of six and six out of six for system B. Precision at the two gram level is one out of five for system A, four out of five for system B. Precision at the three gram level is what kills system A because this precision at the three gram level for system A is zero out of four and for four grams is zero out of three. For system B, three grams are two out of four, four grams are one out of three. The brevity penalty is the same, it's both six out of seven. So when you combine this, the blue score calculated for system A at the sentence level is zero. And for system B, it's 52%. All right, now let's talk multiple references. So the authors of the blue paper strongly suggested the use of multiple references. So this helps by accounting for variability in translation. So this helps take into account the fact that 
there really are multiple legitimate translations. So given a system, here we could have four references, and then in calculating the precision uh, for purposes of n-grams one, two, three, and four for blue, you can use n-grams found in any of the references. All right, so blue is still, for better or worse, very commonly used. One of the metrics that has come closest to dethroning blue, though, is Meteor. So Meteor is quite similar to blue in its use of n-grams and precision. But Meteor does two really important things. It gives partial credit for matching stems, and it gives partial, partial credit for synonyms. So uh, if we've got here a system and a reference, so Jim went home is the system output, Joe goes home was the reference. So here Meteor would give full credit for home because that's a perfect match, but it would also give partial credit for goes and went, for goes matching went, or went matching goes, because those are related terms. Similarly, uh, in matching synonyms, if the system if the system output was Jim walks home and the reference was Jim goes home, then walks and goes are synonyms, and so Meteor would give partial credit for walks matching goes. Meteor also allows the use of paraphrase matching. So let's take a step back and look at various critiques that have been leveled at the use of automated metrics. So these aren't going to apply necessarily to all automated metrics, but they will to some. So one critique is ignoring the relevance of words. So blue in particular, and many other metrics, treat all words the same, including punctuation. So to be more precise, they treat all tokens the same. So every token, including punctuation, counts the same. So matching a comma is counts just as much as matching a content word. So in reality, names and core concepts are more important in translation than determiners and punctuation. Another issue is local scale. So these operate at the local level, and often these metrics do not consider the grammaticality of the entire sentence or the meaning of the entire sentence. Many of these scores are not meaningful. So scores tend to be very test set specific, and the absolute value is not terribly informative. So if, with blue, if you tell me that, so the blue metric ranges from zero to one, or if you multiply by 100, from zero to 100. So if you tell me that somebody got, that a system got a blue score of three on the scale of zero to 100, I'm gonna be able to tell you that's a terrible system. But if somebody tells me that there's a blue score of 27, I'm going to say it depends. It's not terrible, but I can't tell you exactly how good it is. So that's a downside. You would like a score of 27 to be meaningful. There's also the problem that human reference translations tend to score low on blue. This is hypothesized to be because human translations tend to have higher variability due to translators making different word choices. So, automated metrics are low cost, they're tunable, and they're consistent. But, are they correct? Because it doesn't matter if they're low cost, tunable, and consistent if they give answers that don't match with human judgments. But if they do, then we can have some, rely some confidence in them. So how could we do this? Well, you could take a data set, have it translated by a, multiple translation systems, have each of those translation systems rated according to an automated metric, 
and have those same system outputs also rated by human judges. Here is an example from 2002, the Arabic uh, translation task, where that was done. And human judges rated these systems in terms of adequacy and fluency, as well as an automated metric was used, which is closely related to blue. And the correlation here is very close. So this is evidence that the NIST score, which is closely related to blue, is highly correlated with adequacy and with fluency. So that's great. That gives us confidence that blue is doing a good job being correct. But that's not the whole picture. So this is the result from a different, uh, a different task. So this was the NIST, same, same uh, organizers, NIST 2001 versus 2005. And there's an outlier. So some of them correlate pretty well. So this is blue versus adequacy. And everything looks good except for the one that's at the top. So there's one system that had an adequacy that is at about 3.5, which is much better than everything else. The next best system is around 3.2. So big gap in adequacy and a big gap in blue scores. So the system that does second best according to adequacy, the one that's 3.2 in adequacy, is over 5 in terms of blue score, which is good. And this, but the best system lags way back. It's second to worst in terms of blue score. It's about blue of... Uh, 43. So what's going on? Well, it turned out that the participant to this shared task uh, took one, took machine translation output and then had monolingual humans post-edit it. So this was post-edited output versus output of pure statistical systems. And the humans really liked the post-edited output a lot better than the, than the full machine translation output, but blue didn't. So that's a problem, that we've got this mis mismatch in when a human post-edits. There's also the problem that rule-based systems, which tend to operate on principles other than n-gram matching, tend to do pretty poorly, according to Blue, even when they do quite well in terms of adequacy and fluency. So on this plot, we see a SysTran system, which historically was rule-based, syntactic transfer system, uh, getting very low Blue scores, even while getting quite high adequacy and fluency scores, where the machine, the statistical machine translation systems uh, had a cor more of a correlation between their blue score and their human scores. So, metric research is active and ongoing. Uh, many developers, many researchers are looking on an ongoing basis to develop better automated metrics. Metrics that, for example, take into account syntactic similarity or take into account semantic equivalent or semantic entailment. There are metrics that are specifically targeted at capturing issues like reordering, and there are metrics that try to be very trainable. In the WMT competitions now, there is actually a track and has been for a number of years on developing new metrics, and those are evaluated using Pearson's correlation coefficient to rank metrics according to how well they correlate with human judgments. So, to conclude, automated metrics have become an essential tool for machine translation system development. They are, unfortunately are not fully suited to rank systems of different types and the development of metrics both automated and especially, uh, especially automated, but to some extent 
manual, evaluation metric development is still an open challenge.